my talk is going to focus on the uh, elements of the project is looking at, at central places um, in uh, Scotland and Ireland with a particular focus on Ireland. Um, and so our, our project is all about a comparative uh, context, particularly between uh, the major case studies in Ireland and Scotland. Um, I, uh, and then the obvious problem in that sense is that, you know, in Ireland, there's an incredibly well-preserved settlement record um, from uh, this time period, something like 47,000 uh, 47, forts known um, and hundreds of those uh, excavated. Um, and if we compare that to uh, Scotland, where you know, the number of early medieval settlements, picture settlements in particular, is, uh, is, can be um, numbered in the dozens, um, if, if you're generous. Um, and in terms of uh, elite settlements, we know from the historical records, a few historical records we have from this time period, that uh, hill forts and fortified settlements are our key uh, centres of power. Um, but if we look at... Um, uh, the Atlas of Hillforts, for example, um, at Scotland, then if you search on early medieval dates, then you get 27 sites um, with early medieval dates from, from the whole of Scotland. Uh, and if you look at um, the certainty of, of dating here, um, you only have four with a high degree <laughs> of certainty of dating. So, you know, that comparative context is quite difficult when your record um, is like that. So this is where you get, if you look at a uh, high degree of certainty of dating, a very few sites um, from this time period. And that's one of the traditional problems of looking at, uh, at the pics, really, is where are, where are the sites, where are the settlements, uh, and the like. Um, one thing that Pickland um, does share with uh, uh, areas of Ireland is that um, these fortified uh, settlements in the early medieval period, when they appear, um, is, is a second generation of these enclosures. So there's quite a big gap generally between uh, the Iron Age uh, construction of hill forts um, and uh, the um, uptake of this tradition once again in the 5th and 6th centuries in particular uh, when these uh, enclosures become uh, more common across the landscape again. Um, so really part of our project and part of our previous project, um, uh, the Northern Picks project, has been trying to increase the data set um, of sites uh, from this time period by undertaking lots of keyhole excavations um, across northeast Scotland uh, in the territory um, of, of the picks uh, in the main um, and undertaking dozens of excavations, survey work, uh, etc., trying to increase that data set. Um, have we been successful? In some cases, yes. But we've also been very successful at finding sites between 400 and 200 BC. So perhaps we should rename our project 400 to 200 Cal BC project. Um, because that's when the majority of these defended uh, enclosures um, uh, date to uh, in, in Scotland. Um, but we have increased the data set um, a little bit. Um, but what really is the conclusion of that? is that, you know, enclosure is quite rare in this time period. It's not something that you find widely dispersed across the landscape. You know, in 400, 200 BC in the Iron Age, it seems that everyone had a hill fort or they were very common across uh, the landscape. Um, and what we're really also lacking is the kind of intermediate sites as well. So unlike in Ireland where you have ring forts and you have more complex ring forts and you also have promontory forts and the like uh, uh, in some cases, um, there's not really that uh, um, tradition of enclosed settlement um, found wild, widely across the landscape. And again, I think, you know, the recent work looking at these sites um, has really um, supported that. Again, enclosure is something that's <coughs> rare. And when we do find it, it seems that we're really dealing with the elite um, within uh, society. So what we're really looking at when we look at enclosed settlement uh, in the early medieval period in Scotland um, is a, a, a character of enclosure that's quite different to what came before. These sites were rare, um, and although we can't compare the numbers to Ireland, what is telling is that comparison in terms of this tradition was much more um, uh, exclusive um, and rarer uh, in this, uh, in this uh, context. Um, and that's quite interesting because if you also look at the historical record, and I think Nick will talk more about this, 
um, is that uh, the historical records for, for Scotland also focus more on the uh, occurrence of these um, uh, fortified uh, settlements. Um, and that's a really interesting element of the, the historical record. Um, and then in terms of the character of the, these enclosures, again, what we're looking at um, in terms of comparing this to what came before the Iron Age tradition in Scotland is generally a much smaller class of fortified settlement uh, and, and enclosure. So if you compare it to some of the um, larger Iron Age examples, um, here we've got um, one of our uh, uh, beloved sites from the project at, at Rhiney, um, a high status settlement it looks like from the 5th and 6th centuries on the left compared to an Iron Age enclosure. Where you're dealing again with something that's very different. Um, it's a different scale of social organisation perhaps um, that's leading to the construction of these. And again, perhaps the, the focus is more on um, a, a, a more exclusive element of society, you know, a family, uh, uh, an immediate lineage, rather than perhaps the wider kin and tribal networks that led to some of these Iron Age uh, enclosures. Now that's the case even when we look at the kind of more developed nuclear forts, um, so-called nuclear forts from early medieval Scotland, places like Dunad, which are seen as the capitals um, in a traditional sense um, of these polities. And again, you can see how small these were compared to uh, much earlier uh, traditions. Um, so how do we you know, make sense of that? Well, I think one interesting again, if you, uh, element, again, if you look at the um, uh, comparative context is, is that in Pickland, there was um, from quite an early date uh, an overkingship um, that extended over quite a, quite a large territory. Uh, again, this is something that Nick will, I think, um, follow up in, in more detail. Um, and if you compare that to, to Ireland, where you have these uh, multiple, you know, hundreds of, of petty kingdoms extending across the landscape, then you've got something quite different going on in, in Pickland, perhaps. Um, and therefore, that perhaps sheds a new light on these defended settlements being, again, key to a different type of social structure um, and a more extensive um, notion of kingship and, and, and kingly control, perhaps, uh, in Pickland. Um, and that kind of extensive Pictish kingdom is obviously something that's puzzled various uh, scholars in the past. So this is Chris Wickham, quite a famous historian, talking about uh, the Picts here in 2009. Um, first of all, saying how amazingly obscure the, the Picts are uh, even today by um, British standards. Uh, and then talking about um, uh, uh, one of the 8th century kings and how he extended... Um, uh, his, his polity over quite an extensive area. Uh, and this is how he sums this up, you know, how the Picts managed this with no visible in infrastructure and one of the most unpromising terrains in Europe. So rude. Um, <laughs> remains a mystery, but they at least show it was possible. So again, you know, the, you know how did that uh, um, uh, extensive polity really emerge in this unpromising terrain of uh, northeast uh, Scotland? Um, so Looking at these, these sites has been a, a big focus uh, of the project um, and we began to put together all the evidence we have. Um, and so this is a map of what we might term the elite sites in, in Pickland uh, and, and Dal, Dalreda uh, on the bottom left here in, in, in pink. Um, and you can again see you know, we're dealing with quite small numbers really, less, th less than 30. <clears throat> and this is the map based on um, historical sources, um, archaeology, uh, and, and, and place names. Uh, if we look at historical sources alone, then you get even smaller data sets. You're talking about you know, a dozen sites or so. Um, and when you begin to map on um, when these sites are first mentioned in historical sources, again, you see how partial our data is really. So you've got sites that are referred to in the 7th century um, and not again till much later or, or not at all in some cases. Um, and then you've got a whole group of sites mentioned in the 9th and 10th century in central Scotland, which is always seen as the kind of cradle of um, the later kingdom of, of Scotland. But again, you can see how late these references are really. So again, is it really giving us the, the full picture of where these, these major uh, power centres were? Uh, in the early medieval period. 
<coughs> and then just the, on a basic level, you know, what are these sites doing? What are they in the landscape? Um, from the historical records, you get a, a, a rough sense that these places were settlements of some kind. Um, they were involved in warfare, for sure. Um, and at times, they were clearly quite extensive settlements. You know, Dumbarton, for example, uh, British site. Um, uh, Vikings plundering in this in 870 and taking away uh, 200 ships of plunder and uh, as slaves. So clearly, they were quite extensive settlements. But in terms of our archaeological record, it's quite, we have quite poor understanding uh, of these sites. Um, they also clearly had other roles within society. Uh, as places of inauguration, for example, and ceremony and ritual. Uh, so this is the famous footprint stone from, from Danad, um, uh, interpreted as a, as a place of inauguration of, of the kings of, of, of Dalriera. Um, and then in terms of you know, our uh, understanding these sites, um, archaeological uh, investigation of them has been very, very slight. So famous program of Leslie Alcock in the, in the 1970s, very much kind of keyhole trenches, getting some basic dating evidence for these. Uh, and this picture here is one of probably you know, four or five um, structures or houses from one of these sites within Pickland. So it's you know a real embarrassment of riches in terms of what we can draw on uh, to uh, tackle these, these questions. Um, so really just to kind of end the talk, just to give you a, a kind of brief highlights of some of the results of our uh, project over the last four or five years um, and beginning to get, I think, more of a sense of how these centres develop through time, their origins uh, and some of their, their dimensions, you know, as settlements, as places of ritual and ceremony um, and really as clearly quite um, central nodes within early medieval uh, society. Um, so some of the uh, earliest sites um, seem to uh, emerge in, in, the, in the late Roman period, uh, exactly in the same time period the Picts are first introduced in historical sources, uh, in late Roman sources. Uh, and so this site here at Dunnock Hare uh, in Aberdeenshire in, in, in North East Scotland um, is a really intriguing site. Uh, it's got early examples or what would traditionally be seen as early examples of, of Pictish stones from this site. Um, and in terms of the uh, settlement inside, uh, we also have structures that don't really uh, resolve themselves as the classic kind of Iron Age roundhouses. They look like they're moving towards oval or rectangular buildings. So we seem to have a change of architecture in that late Roman period. Um, and that's really the time period when the settlement really um, disappears from the archeological record to a large uh, extent. Um, and what we also have from the site, um, it's a very eroded promontory fort by the looks of it, um, is some really interesting uh, evidence for contacts with the Roman world, uh, including bits of glass, bits of pottery, uh, very rare in this part, part of uh, Scotland, uh, and some very unusual materials, things like a, a shard from a, a Hoffheim cup, like a very beautifully decorated uh, blue glass painted cups, a very unusual Roman material finding its way to uh, uh, this site in the, in the late Roman period. So this is what it would look like, obviously. Here's one we made earlier. Um, and uh, these are the dates, you know, 200 to 400 AD. So again, very unusual site dating to that time period in Scotland in terms of a, uh, an enclosed settlement. Uh, so it looks like, you know, it's emerging uh, in this late Roman period. Uh, and then um, uh, the big site we've been working on for the last uh, uh, eight, nine years uh, is, is, is Rhiney uh, in North East Scotland again. Um, and this dates to the late 4th century through to the 6th centuries. Um, and what we see here, I think, is a much more obvious materialization of rulership at this enclosed settlement. Um, so it's a, again a landscape that's dotted with carved stone monuments, including one of the warrior figures that uh, Mark showed as, as a parallel for one, the Tulloch Walker. Uh, and that comes from a cemetery uh, associated um, with uh, the um, settlement at Rhiney. Um, and so you, you, I think you see the more obvious uh, kind of materialization of 
elements of, of, of kingship. So, for example, the, the kind of famous stone from this site is the Rhiney man carrying this axe, and that axe is very similar to the axe you find in the Sutton Hoo ship burial that's been argued to be associated with um, uh, pole axing cattle and cattle sacrifice uh, in, the, in this time period. Um, so the stones are really, I think, um, a, a, a very important clue as to the kind of um, how rulership is being depicted um, and denoted uh, in, in this time period. Um, and the fact that, you know, it's warrior ideology is be beginning to be weaved into uh, how these uh, sites operate uh, in, in the landscape. Um, and then here you can see the dates as, say, kind of late, late 4th century through to the middle of, middle of the 6th century. Um, and so beginning to, again, pin down the chronology of these sites in a much more uh, definite manner. Um, and then uh, we've also been looking at these more developed uh, hill forts that you get in the early medieval period as well. Um, so-called nuclear forts with a kind of hierarchical organization um, and beginning to get a clearer chronology for these sites. Uh, so these seem to emerge in the late 6th century, early 7th century um, and go through to perhaps 9th, 10th century, perhaps beyond. Um, and we can see uh, that these were um, clearly important regional centres. So this is uh, one we've been working on recently, Mither Tap. Um, its, its place name means, uh, uh, it's likely to mean Hill of the K, and the K is one of the seven sons of, of Cruthne, who's mentioned in the Pictish uh, kinglets. So it's clearly you know, a regional centre, I think, in this, in this part of, of the world. Um, and uh, excavations just, just this year um, show evidence for high status metalworking, uh, big animal bone assemblages uh, that uh, Ed's going to talk more about, uh, and a kind of more and more elaborate architecture to these sites. So this is a very elaborate well um, built into the lower rampart of the fort um, and based around this really impressive granite tor. Uh, and this, again, dates, it's just some of the uh, initial dates we've got, 7th, 8th century uh, in date. Um, and then what's really obvious about these kind of uh, um, uh, regional centres is just how this shared ideology of space is found quite widely. So Mither Tap uh, and Danad and Dalrida, very, very similar organisation of space uh, and scale, um, and you find that uh, elsewhere as well. Um, do you know? Okay, a couple of minutes. Um, and then one other interesting element of our uh, uh, redating program um, has been showing actually, in some cases, some of these sites have very long lived histories, but others uh, seemingly have quite a short lifespan. So, this is a site dug in the 50s and 60s, completely destroyed by quarrying now, um, but we had the animal bone assemblage and we just uh, commissioned a series of dates on the site. And this is what we go back. Uh, and these were the dates from all the ramparts we could date and all the different um, phases of uh, settlement within. And the dates are almost identical. It looks like this site had a very short lifespan. Um, so some of these sites look like they're emerging. Uh, huge investments in constructing ramparts and, and settlement, but actually some of them not enduring uh, through time. Um, so, you know, kind of failed uh, elite centres uh, in this time period. And then finally, just to, just to end, this is uh, our most recent work as part of the Comparative Kingship Project, looking at uh, the site called Burg Head, uh, which is a big promontory fort uh, in uh, the Murray Firth region. Again, you can see some of the uh, fantastic sculpture. You get these sites, bulls here, pretty obvious symbolism um, uh, here, uh, and also early Christian sculpture. So uh, these sites going on into the se uh, uh, second half of the first millennium AD, uh, and again, the architecture getting more and more elaborate uh, and the size of these increasing in scale as well. This is almost five hectares, this site. Um, and in terms of, you know, the embarrassment of riches, we kind of got the opposite here. Wherever we put trench in, in this site, we're finding building plans, structures, uh, sunken buildings, buildings um, being constructed from the 7th century through to, to the 10th century. Uh, and again, getting a very good chronology uh, for that. So really just to conclude, I think, you know, uh, although we're not always uh, comparing like with like in terms of number of sites 
and the like between Ireland and Scotland, sometimes that's quite telling in its, in its own right. And in this case, I think it really shows that something like enclosed settlement was much more um, exclusive and, and a rarer phenom phenomena in Scotland. And that's perhaps how this more extensive uh, overkingship of, of Pickman was enacted. And these um, uh, central places were, were, were very key in terms of uh, that uh, element. Um, and some of these forts clearly remained in use right up till the 9th, 10th centuries AD, but places like Burghead look like they're destroyed in that late 1st millennium AD, and that may well have led to big changes like the uh, ending of the Pictish kingdoms in that 10th century uh, context. Okay, so thank you very much.